Welcome everyone to this uh, Bachelor of Communication Media Industry Talk uh, in our Semester 2 series. I'm joined today by uh, Elizabeth McCarthy. Elizabeth has worked as a producer and presenter in radio for 20 years. She currently works as a uh, Breakfasters and Talks producer at Triple R and reviews books on Breakfasters and ABC Radio Melbourne. She regularly appears at live events and public conversations, interviewing writers for the Wheeler Centre, Sydney Writers Festival, Melbourne Writers Festival, and many others. Thanks, Elizabeth, so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me. That's all right. I guess I just wanted to start, um, you know, obviously we have a lot of students who are really interested in radio and in audio media. So I suppose I wanted to start by asking you, you know, what drew you to, to radio and, and how did you get started? Well, I can't, I can't really answer that question without telling you just a bit about the house I grew up in with my parents and my sister. So my dad was obsessed with radio. Uh, there's no other way to put it. And he was a channel surfer, a radio channel surfer. And so from first thing in the morning to late at night, the radio was always on in the house and the TV just wasn't on as much as the radio. And when I grew up, there were only four television channels anyway. So, um, and my parents couldn't afford a VCR until I was like 15 years old. So um, there were just heaps of radio stations as well to listen to, as there still are in Melbourne. So, so Dad would either have ABC local radio, 3CR or 3AW on, as well as a bunch of different top 40 radio music stations. Um, so I certainly watched TV growing up, but in terms of media consumption of music, art and culture um, and politics, I overwhelmingly absorbed all of that via radio. And I was obsessed with music from, from when I was um, a toddler. And I was just this little music fan from the get-go. Um, I was also a bit shy, so I, I didn't really share this music obsession that I had um, with friends until I was like 12 or 13. And, um, a friend called Fleur came into my life and Fleur was just as much of a music fan as I was. And um, so we shared each other's fandom with each other and she and I were just fanatical music buddies. And pretty soon we were sort of doing things like turning up at the Dogs in Space film set, you know, hoping to bump into Michael Hutchins and hanging out, <laughs> hanging out. D um, did that work? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. It, we, we, it clearly turned up, you know, at a very boring time on set because, you know, as, as anyone who's been on film sets knows, film sets are actually pretty boring places unless there's shooting happening and shooting doesn't happen a lot. People are just kind of standing around waiting for the shooting to start. So no, we did not meet Michael Hutchins, um, but we, we would, you know, try to talk our way backstage at stadium shows to meet rock stars and things like that. So we were, we were real music fans. And in my late teens, I began listening to Triple R and became engrossed in the local independent and underground um, music scenes. And I spent my free time seeing local bands play. And years later, I played drums in a band for four years. And I wrote about music for Beat Magazine for five years. And, uh, and I got involved as a volunteer at Triple R and I presented music shows and the weekly book show. And eight years ago, I became employed by Triple R as their um, talks producer. And then that moved into being the Breakfasters and Talks producer. So the reason I, the reason I bring up my childhood is um, my, childhood would, <laughs> my childhood was by no means, you know, sunshine and lollipops, but it really shaped me significantly growing up with two parents who were really inquisitive about music and culture and politics. And they, they both grew up, my parents, really poor. And dad in particular was full of rage about the way that the world is organised against the poor and against the marginalised. And he was politically active in a number of uh, grassroots local um, political causes. And, and that was the environment in which I was raised. And my parents' curiosity and passions and outrage really rubbed off on me and shaped my curiosities and my passions and my interests. So given that background, it, it's somewhat of a natural extension that I would become involved in a radio station and a media organisation like Triple R, where contemporary music and the arts are at the forefront of what we do 
as he's critiquing politics and exploring issues mm. around social justice, it's kind of the ideal place for me to get involved in and to work for. So, that, I mean, that sort of takes care of my next question, which was kind of why Triple R. Um, but, but I wonder if I might ask you, is there something about radio, you, you know, maybe beyond, beyond nostalgia and beyond mm. sort of a, a childhood connection mm. there? Um, you know, is there something about the medium of radio, you know, um, we'll, we'll get on maybe a little bit later to talking yeah. about, uh, to ch uh, talking about changes recently, but, you know, perhaps why has radio lasted so long? Is there something about the medium that... It's very, it's, it's very, it's an intimate um, medium, obviously, you know, you eavesdropping on conversations. It's all also a place where news often breaks um, and... As far as resourcing, um, if, if you're a media practitioner working, you can make, uh, you can get news quicker if you're doing radio rather than if you're having to deal with like, you know, a film, a small, you know, a cameraman lighting and, you know, a presenter sort of having to be ready. Um, there's something quicker about radio I think as a medium and I it, it, it's you know it's far older as well than um, than television um so so as far as listening to it there's something wonderful about eavesdropping into radio and it also being a bit less glamorous than say television which sort of um I guess has has a veneer of an aesthetic sort of a, a bit more sort of glossiness, whereas radio mm -hmm. to me, to my ears, feels a bit more real. And certainly as a, um, as a producer, um, I just really enjoy radio. You, and you also don't have to really worry about what you look like. And that's actually important. So what the most important thing is in radio is what's actually coming out of the the human voice and what what the human mouth is expressing as opposed to on television say where the set's also really important the lighting's really important so radio is um to me is it is kind of uh rawer and it's a bit rootsier and uh it's a bit more real mm. yeah yeah um you mentioned your role as a producer i wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about what a uh, talks producer actually is and does yeah, on a day-to-day sure. -day basis so basically um i collaborate with our talks presenters at triple r to varying degrees depending on what their needs are and what kind of shows that they're presenting so for example our breakfast show is on air 15 hours a week and that takes up the bulk of my time in terms of generating content for them um, collaborating with them etc some of our talk shows are quite self-sufficient so they don't really need much of my help at all um, but basically a, a, a producer a radio producer does a ton of reading um, you absorb a lot of information you write a lot of emails you hassle people for interviews you hunt down interview ideas you have conversations with presenters about how they want to shape their show from week to week and day to day um, you provide feedback about interviews to presenters um, and you worry incessantly about deadlines um, and being triple r's breakfasters and talks producer i'm always thinking about the point of difference that Triple R provides to our audience. So I'm always thinking about um, the kinds of stories we do and the way that we do them. And we cover stories and interviews and issues and culture in a fashion that seeks to provide a point of difference from the way that other media covers things. Um, Triple R never really tries to be at all in my time there. I've never heard anyone have a conversation about let's try to be more like you know, this commercial station, or let's try to be more like the ABC in this aspect. There's, it, it's actually trying to be a very distinctive and individual um, media organisation. So, yeah. so to answer your question about what a talks producer does, um, we do a variety of things, but basically um, I hunt down uh, <laughs> interview ideas. And some of those interviews ideas come really easily because people will write in, you know, emails to me requesting, um, requesting interviews. So, you know, an average day I'm sort of dealing with, well, pre-COVID's changed a lot of things, but like pre-COVID I'd have over, over a hundred um, interview requests a day coming through. 
Um, across, all, across all topics. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yep. So everything from books to science to film to politics to social justice and human rights issues. So, um, yeah, so a lot of people want to um, get on air and, and talk about their book or their film or uh, their social justice campaigning, etc. cetera. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of things can sort of land in your lap. Um, but then a so, lot of, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, so, like, once you've got, um, you know, you've got an idea or someone's approached you for a mm. story, yeah. is, is it sort of a matter of then assigning that to a presenter and then they kind of take it from there? Do you sort of no, work with I, the presenter? Yeah, very good question. To... So, because it's Triple R and we have enormous um, trust and faith in our presenters, so I, I never lock in anything without asking a presenter if they want to do something. Um, so, it's basically a, a radio station where presenters have the ultimate say about whether they want to do an interview or not. Um, I can certainly, you know, with the breakfast team in particular, I have a, a particular role in sort of shaping that show so that there's a really good balance of interviews and content across the week. Um, so, you know, I'll say to breakfast something like, you know, I really think we should cover this story. I, you know, I haven't seen it elsewhere in the media. Let's give this some air time. Um, but ultimately, it is the presenters who come back and say, no, this doesn't interest me, Elizabeth, or, or hey, I really want to do this. So presenters will often pitch to me too and say is it okay if I do this and then I'll sort of check that it's not being covered elsewhere and also kind of check that it's triple R appropriate and there's no sort of um there's no kind of nefarious uh, undertone or there's no sort of corporate interest um underlying a particular interview idea um so so yeah does that answer that question so yeah. so there's a lot of back and forth between myself publicists um, members of the community, artists, present uh, the presenters at Triple R about what they want to do. So it's all this sort of collaboration and negotiation that goes on. So it sounds like you're never really struggling to fill a spot. Or... No, yeah. no. If anything, um, you know, turning people down for interviews can be really hard, but that's just the way it is because... Yeah. We, um, we only have sort of limited airtime. You know, we're a 24-7 station, but um, as talks producer, we only have a certain amount of talk shows. Sometimes we do standalone interviews, which we just publish on our website, and certainly in the future, that's probably something we'll do more of. Um, but we can't always accommodate every interview request, that's for sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I wonder if you'd... Um... You know, we've talked a little bit about radio overall and its long history, but I wonder if you can um, speak a little bit about, you know, in the time that you've been involved with radio, you know, what, what has changed with, you know, increasing use of digital technology, um, increasingly probably people coming through the door with a different skill set or, you know, a sort of different awareness of audio media, perhaps coming to it through podcasting and so on. Um, yeah. how, how has radio changed, you know, in, in the digital era, broadly, broadly defined? Um, well, I guess getting back to my childhood, this is what we used to listen to the radio on. So this is... The, here's, all, here's, a, here's one way to think yeah. <laughs> all, all this does is play live radio. That's it. So, so these days you can listen to the radio on your phone, on your laptop, on your device, on your smart speaker, on your TV... Um, basically, you can consume radio via many different means um, that aren't technically, in the old school sense, a radio. So, um, uh, so with digital technology, you can listen to radio that happened yesterday or a year ago. You can listen via on demand or via podcast. These are massive changes. Um, and I mean, we, we sort of talk about the media as though, you know, the media's only really changed in the last sort of 20 years with the internet. But the, obviously, you know, since, since the printing press and, um, and radio and television, like changes have been happening in media. There's been a steady flow of change, but it just feels like in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years in particular, to my mind, that the changes have been really rapid. Um, so live radio shows these days can be edited in a myriad of ways and are repackaged for consumption in a myriad of ways. So you can edit and chop up live radio shows um, in various formats, such as podcasts or, you know, snippets on social media platforms, etc. cetera. Um, and, and radio never used to be edited and redistributed in this 
kind of fashion. Um, and some commercial radio stations now also film their radio shows. You know, they have cameras that film their studios, what happens in their radio studios 24-7. Um, um, we don't do that at Triple R, but we, you know, we do bits and pieces. We film some stuff in our studios. So, so all this is sort of relatively new. The, you know, the live streaming of radio shows onto YouTube or the live streaming of radio shows onto Facebook or what have you. So... So that's been really significant. Um, I guess I should also mention that, I mean, Triple R doesn't consider itself these days as just a radio station. We consider ourselves as a media organisation that primarily does radio, primarily does live radio, but there's other ways that we engage our audience, such as through our online platforms, through events in our live performance space, um, through outside broadcasts that we do where subscribers and audiences come along. Um, through our website. Our website is a highly engaged um, arm of Triple R. So, you know, we have our Trip magazine, which we've had for a long time. Um, yeah, so there's live broadcasts and out outreach events that Triple R does. So there's all sorts of ways that um, we're engaging with audiences, as is every radio station. And that's a massive change. It's not just li listening to, you know, one person t or two people talking live to you from a you know, a nostalgic little box like this anymore yeah. at all. Yeah, fantastic. I wonder, um, you know, what are some of the, you know, the opportunities and challenges of working in, in media for, for a media organisation? Um, I suppose I could kind of go pretty broadly. I mean... <laughs> As a producer, one of the challenges is keeping on top of information um, because we're living in this time of uh, information overload and, you know, really an information revolution in terms of the way that um, information is produced and distributed. Uh, this is an extraordinary time and it's sometimes overwhelming how much information there is. So I can't be across everything um, as much as I'd like to be. So, so for example, so we have a film show on Triple R called Primal Screen that I collaborate with, but I can't, um, I can't watch as much screen as I would like to. I just can't. Um, I don't have the time. So I'm not sort of up to date on Netflix and stuff. However, the presenters of that show no screen culture so extraordinarily well that they don't need to lean on me <laughs> to um, to an extent where I'm sort of um, where where they're suffering at all where their show suffers at all. So this this is the other thing too. So in in this time of time of um, information overload, one of the blessings of Triple R is that all our presenters know stuff. So so all our presenters get a show on Triple R not because they've got a university degree necessarily because it's because they know their stuff. So if they're doing um, a film show, it's because they are massive fans of film and they might've, you know, written for film magazines or written uh, film blogs or what have you. Um, Richard Watts, who does our art show, our flagship arts show on a Thursday morning, Smart Arts. Richard is heavily in, I mean, he's an arts journalist, but he's also, you know, he's out seeing theatre several nights a week. Um, so, uh, so I basically collaborate with people who know their stuff, which helps me. And, um, yeah, so, so that kind of challenge is somewhat diminished by the talent that I am lucky enough to work with at Triple R in terms yeah. of me feeling like I can't stay on top of all this information, you know. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's collaborating with a lot of really... Um, really smart people who know their stuff and are passionate and are, are curious as well. It's, yeah, it's, it seems like it's kind of a, both a challenge and an opportunity in some way to kind of, you know, to, to feel a little bit of pressure to sort of be across a whole bunch of stuff, but also mm. learning, learning how to communicate and work with people who, who do know, you know, that you're sort of happy to hand over that expertise baton to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
you know, I mean, I gravitate towards reading huge slabs of information anyway. I mean, this is kind of what, you know, what I do, apart from Triple R, when I do, you know, host live events for the Wheeler Centre and the Writers' Festival and stuff like that, I, um, you know, my favourite thing to do in my downtime is to read more information. Yeah, <laughs> Which, uh, you know, it really is. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's kind of my life. It, it's it really suits every single interest area that I have. Being a producer, being yeah. across a, you know a wide range of kind of um, of ideas and and uh, cultural moments, etc. Yeah, yeah. I, I I suppose you know as as I mentioned, we have quite a few students who are are really interested in moving into radio or audio yeah. media. I wonder if um, you know maybe beyond beyond the skills that they might conceivably pick up during their time at university. So there'll be, you know, technical skills and so on. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit of project management uh, and that sort of thing. You know, is there, are there any skills or um, things they should be learning about uh, that might put them in a, in a good position to, to sort of get that foot in the door somewhere? Yeah, I mean, you know, I would be... Um I would I would really just embrace media that's available that you can do stuff with yourself, such as I would I would be blogging about your interests on Instagram. Um, I would be, you know, I would be tweeting about stuff that you're seeing, you know, whether if you're going to the theatre every night or whatever or seeing live comedy, I would be tweeting about stuff. Um, I would be knocking on the door of Sin FM and saying, hey, I'd love to get on air. Can you train me? And, you know, I can volunteer behind the scenes. I'd try to get as much experience as possible. Um, particularly in Melbourne, you're in such a unique position where there are so many community radio stations who need volunteers. Um, Triple R is in a position where um, COVID again has sort of changed things because we can't have the volunteer engagement that we did because um, of social distancing and, you know, having to have a COVID safe workplace. But, um, but getting involved with a community radio station um, is just a really good idea. And you just learn so much. Like, I'm not particularly, um, I'm not a particularly sort of technically minded person. So when I first learnt the studio at Triple R, learnt how to operate the radio studios there, it kind of took me a while to, um, to learn that stuff. And one of the um, misgivings I had was that I thought, oh, it's taking me too long to sort of work out how to use a radio studio. Maybe I'm not suited to radio. And looking back, that's the least of your problems. I think when you're, when you're making media, You'll, you'll learn the tech. It might take you a while. But, I mean, your biggest asset is your initiative and your curiosity and your interests and your ability to learn and to work hard, really. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really, you know, media is really competitive, um, probably now more than ever before, because the jobs are, the jobs are, not, um, are not as much there as they used to be. I think... As a media practitioner, you're expected to have a, a really wide range of skills these days. So, you know, not only be, say, a presenter on air, but also know how to edit your own podcast, how to upload to a website, how to even make your own website that attaches to your show, you know, these kinds of things. So, yeah, so I think that sort of um, staying across new technology is really important, being really patient with yourself, but, you know, just really being passionate about your interests. And again, if you live in Melbourne, like the arts community generally, pre-COVID, um, the arts community here is absolutely thriving, you know, as is, um, as is the cinema scene and the comedy scene. And, you know, there's just so much happening in Melbourne. So participating in Melbourne culture and reflecting that back to listeners whether you're producing and presenting on sin or producing and presenting on pbs or 3cr or triple r or what have you um is is something that you can really do you can actually do it yeah and you can start now if you know that sort of you thing you can and if you if if you know if it's impossible at the moment to get involved with sin or a community station then why not just start your own podcast yeah you know, it might be something that you do, like you might make a 20 minute podcast every week about, yeah. um, you know, comedy or some niche interest that you have, but getting that sort of media um, experience, you can just start doing it yourself. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, obviously, we just mentioned the current situation. It's something that I don't think any of us can ignore. Um, you know, I wonder if uh, you'd mind just telling us a little bit about how the pandemic has affected your day to day in your role, yeah. but also maybe Triple R more broadly. Yeah, so the pandemic is, uh, well, it's pretty amazing. I am working from home all the time. I go into the station uh, once a week uh, to check my mail and to do a few other things. Um, and so I'm collaborating with people via Zoom, via Google Meets, via Skype, um, via email, and that's just the way it is. So the breakfast show, um, the breakfast, the three breakfast presenters at Triple R haven't been in the same room as each other for months. Um, as their producer, I haven't seen any of them in the flesh for months. But, um, you know, and the radio show that you hear them do every morning is they, one's in Venus Bay, one's in Coburg and the other's in Richmond. So, yeah, well. yeah. and so Triple R's been incredibly innovative in terms of um, having to innovate new technology and new ways of doing things. It's been quite an extraordinary time. So, been, I mean, yeah. radio is considered, particularly community radio, is considered an essential service, isn't it? Yes. It must be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, so sort of make it work. Yeah, so some presenters go into the station. Uh, we have a lot of presenters uh, making their radio shows live at home. And then we have other presenters who are pre-recording their, their show at home and sending it through in audio files to us to upload. So... So, yeah, there's actually a variety of ways that, that shows are being made. I mean, prior to this, no one ever did their show from home. Um, we had one broadcaster a few years ago who was um, occasionally doing shows from home because he was unable to get into the station. But um, this, is, this is a brand new time and, you know, we're just doing things completely differently. And so Triple R as a workplace was really bustling and, um, you know, it was a real community centre as much as it's a you know, a place where we all work really hard. It's, it was actually a place that was, um, had a high level of, you know, traffic coming through every day. And, um, you know, I, I really miss my work colleagues a lot. Um, having meetings online is, is not quite the same. But, um, yeah, we're getting through it. We just had a really successful radiothon, which was really heartwarming and wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I wonder if that, you know, we'd probably a nice bookend to this talk is, is this yeah. idea of the immediacy and comfort of radio as yeah, well. And I think yeah. that's probably, a lot of people are probably relying on that a little bit at the moment. Well, we've had an, like, I don't want to say more than ever, but we have had such an amount of correspondence coming through to the station about how people are enjoying the station more than ever, how the station's been there for them in this really weird time. And mm -hmm. so people are listening to us, it feels like more than ever. Um, and people are being really generous in financially supporting us more, more than ever. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing how, how touched people are. The Triple R is still on air. And it's sort of like, you know, you can look at it as if like, you know, well, we have been on air for 40 years. Why would we go away now? But it's um, people, I think, have really appreciate, uh, appreciating the place that Triple R mm -hmm. has in Melbourne in particular right now. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that after everything was cancelled, you know, it's one yeah, of those yeah. things that like you just sort of stop taking things for granted a little bit. And, yes. And it's good that so many were sort of putting their money where their mouths were over yeah. the last week or two. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Elizabeth. Um, I'm sure you won't mind if, if we get any questions through from students where you wouldn't mind if we sort of collate them and pass them on to you. Not at all. That's um, totally fine. But yeah, um, all the best for the next little while. And uh, thanks, Daniel, and thanks. It's lovely to speak to you too. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, cool. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye.